One of the really cool things about animation is that if you can draw it, you can make your characters look like anything. Four arms, no arms, seven eyes, normal human, completely inhuman, skeleton, suits of armors, animals, animal people, other animal people, hyper-realistic, abstract, you name it. Obviously, there are limits for what may or may not be practical, but the possibilities are only limited by your imagination. Basically, the way a character is designed can either convey a lot of information about the character or the limits of the designer. And with something as fluid and expansive as animation, where you can design a character to look like practically anything, I think that's really interesting to see how that translates to gender identity and presentation. Gender is often thought of as two separate boxes, either male or female, and you're one or the other, when in reality, many of these identifiers are arbitrary and gender is a spectrum. Culturally, we tend to perceive different traits and attributes as either masculine or feminine, even when some of those attributes aren't at all gender specific, like hair length. There's the relatively recent concept of branding pink and blue as code to signify gender, or that certain clothing items like pants or dresses are gendered. And inevitably what happens when you try to categorize all of these individual attributes as either male or female, you just eventually end up at, what is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets, but enough talk, have at you. Everyone is different and even the average experience does not apply to all people. I think early video games are particularly interesting when designers had to differentiate a character as female with very limited resources, and the result is pretty reductive. How do you even assign gender to something as simple as a featureless circle with a mouth and, uh, well, it's something. Oh, yes, the two genders, hats and bows. I think something like Ms. Pac-Man just goes to show how arbitrary gender assignment is. Like, there's nothing physically different between these circles, it's just presentation. But we've come a long way from Ms. Pac-Man. And when it comes to character creation and gender, the ways to depict that are practically endless. Today we're going to look at a few common categories that gender non-conforming characters usually fall into, and then a few specific characters more in depth. But before we get to that, Something to note right off the bat is that when it comes to pronouns, English and Japanese are very different. The most common English pronouns are feminine, she, her, masculine, he, him, and gender neutral, they, them, which can either refer to a group of people or an individual without specifying gender. But Japanese has a whole slew of different pronouns with different meanings and connotations. And instead of using gendered pronouns to refer to another person, Japanese is structured so that the first person singular pronouns I, me, and my, which are gender neutral in English, are gendered in Japanese. I'll try to list a character's pronouns on screen when talking about them, but for the sake of this video, you only really need to be familiar with boku, which is mostly used by young boys, but sometimes in anime can be used by more tomboyish girls as well. This is why, when it comes to translating a character with an ambiguous gender in English, a lot of translators will just ignore that aspect and just use gendered pronouns instead. Some of the characters that I'm going to talk about are explicitly non-binary, some of them are gender non-conforming, some of them use gendered pronouns, and some of them don't. Some of them just don't have English pronouns, or if they do, they were chosen arbitrarily. I'm going to do my best not to misgender anyone, but remember, at the end of the day, these characters are fictional and I can't ask what their preferred pronouns are. Also, this is literally just my opinion. I'm only offering a few of many potential possibilities of how these characters might be interpreted as, and I'm not trying to contradict anyone who might read these characters differently than I would. Also, this list is in no way going to be comprehensive, so if I miss your personal favorite gender nonconforming icon, please feel free to leave a comment. Agender aliens. One of the ways to explore gender is through sci-fi or fantasy where an author can create a whole species that isn't limited by the human experience. Aliens are one of the most common examples because by principle they're fundamentally different from humans. Maybe they don't sexually reproduce, making the concept of gender completely irrelevant. Like in Steven Universe and Land of the Lustrous where the aliens are made of gemstones and are agender. Despite this, the Steven Universe gems almost always use she, her pronouns, while the Land of the Lustrous gems use the pronoun Boku to refer to themselves, and the English dub put a lot of work in to not use any gendered language for the characters. Kirby is a hungry pink little alien blob who was given he, him pronouns in English, but whose gender has been deliberately left ambiguous in Japanese. Maybe your alien species doesn't have a fixed physical form and can change at will, like Double Trouble, a non-binary shapeshifter that uses they, them pronouns. However, this trope isn't limited to aliens. Monsters, robots, and other humanoid creatures can also fall into this category. 
Envy from Full Metal Alchemist is a shape-shifting homunculus and never uses pronouns to refer to themselves and instead refers to themselves in name only. The Chimera Ants from Hunter Hunter are a mixture of humans and animals that do have a fixed concept of gender, but Neferopito is ambiguously gendered. They use Boku to refer to themselves, and in the anime, they were given a slightly fuller chest than in the manga. Metaton from Undertale, a ghost in the machine and overdramatic pop star, wears pink heels, full-length dresses, and glam makeup. Many fans interpret Metaton as a trans man due to his diary entries from when he was a ghost. Because of his feelings about the robot body Alphys wanted to build for him, which, in his words, is, A form beyond my wildest fantasies. In a form like that, I could finally feel like myself. Which is pretty interesting considering that the other ghosts in Undertale, like Nabstablook and the Mad Dummy, are referred to with they them pronouns. And actually, the Mad Dummy has some very similar dialogue after they possess an animatronic anime cat girl and become Mad Mimu, who then uses she her pronouns. Which I think lends a further level of credence to the transitioning interpretation. Anyway, there's a lot of cool fun stuff that can be done with non-human characters in regards to gender. However, one of the problems with the way non-binary characters are depicted in media is that the majority of them are aliens, monsters, or robots, meaning that their gender identity is inherently tied to their non-humanness and is just a product of their unique biology. Now here's the thing. A lot of these characters, like the Crystal Gems and Double Trouble, are made by non-binary creators, and this is because characters that have no fixed biological concept of gender or can shapeshift at will are absolutely a power fantasy for non-binary people. This only becomes a problem when it's the only way that non-binary people are represented in media, because it doesn't actually represent how actual non-binary people with their normal human bodies exist and choose to present themselves. Personally, I love all of the non-binary alien monster robots out there, and I would be sad to lose them. But if you're planning to make your alien species non-binary, then maybe also include some NB humans too. And speaking of NB humans... Okay, so before we start talking about gender nonconforming humans, it's important to know the difference between gender presentation and gender identity. So, your gender identity is your personal sense of your own gender. For cisgender people, your gender identity is the same as your biological gender that you were born with, whereas transgender, gender fluid, and non-binary people may identify with a different gender than they were assigned at birth. On the other hand, gender presentation or expression is how one chooses to style and present themselves. For a lot of people, their identity and presentation are going to be the same, but this isn't universally true for everyone. For example, a butch lesbian may choose to present as very masculine while still identifying as a woman. And the reason that I bring this up is because people often seem to mix up androgyny as being synonymous with non-binary and assume that non-binary people have to look or dress a certain way to be considered actually non-binary. Non-binary is an umbrella term for gender identities that are neither male or female and exist outside of the gender binary, whereas androgyny is presentation. It is dressing or looking in a way that is not clearly masculine or feminine or maybe a combination of both. Not all non-binary people are androgynous and not all androgynous people are non-binary, okay? Okay. So in this next category, we have a couple of examples of human characters where they present in a way that is gender non-conforming, but it's unclear if this also applies to their sense of gender identity. And first up is Kashima from Monthly Girls Nozaki-kun. At the very least, Kashima is 100% a theater gay. Kashima plays the leading role of a prince in the school plays similar to the Takarazuka Review, which is a Japanese musical theater group where all the roles are performed by women. Physically, Kashima is tall, flat-chested, and keeps her hair cut short, and when she gets sick one day and her voice is really low and gravelly, she wears a boy's uniform. And outside of school, her casual clothes are all typically masculine. Kashima uses the watashi pronoun, which is a slightly formal, non-gendered way to refer to oneself, but is typically used by women in casual conversation. Utena, the titular character from Revolutionary Girl Utena, wants to become a prince, refers to herself using boku, and wears a boy's uniform, and that's all normal for her. Utena picks and chooses what she likes from the gender binary without any regards to rules or labels. And if that means she's going to show up to school with long hair, a boy's uniform on top, and booty shorts on the bottom, well, frankly, nothing's going to stop her. Kurapika from Hunter x Hunter wears the traditional robes of his people, which is basically a dress. He wears earrings, his hair long, and disguised himself as a woman a couple of times. 
And of course, we can't forget Howl Pendragon, I see no point in living if I can't be beautiful, Jenkins, disaster wizard extraordinaire. Howl is a bit of a peacock. He puts a lot of time into looking good, including dyeing his hair, wearing jewelry, and of course, his iconic pink jacket. As for animated characters that actually identify as gender nonconforming, well, like I said, it's pretty slim pickings. The human children from Undertale and Deltarune, Chris, Kara, and Frisk, all use they-them pronouns and dress in a way that is androgynous. While these characters are mostly the silent protagonist type, Chris is exclusively referred to by their friends and family with they-them pronouns, and it just it makes me so unbelievably happy to see that. In Soul Eater, the English translation of the manga and anime defaulted to using he-him pronouns for Krona. But the creator, Atsushi Okubo, has made a point to never specify Krona's gender, and that their gender is simply unknown. And the new 2020 translation of the manga uses they-them pronouns for Krona, and that's so exciting! There are also several examples of characters in anime that are more or less explicitly transgender, like Lily from Zombieland Saga, Minas from Heaven's Design Team, Shuichi from Wandering Sun, and Alika from Hunter x Hunter. Again, Japanese doesn't have a specific word for being transgender and are more likely to use the English word as a loan word. The word okama is the most similar, but it's a pretty loaded term and is kind of derogatory and doesn't differentiate between being gay, cross-dressing, or being trans. Also, I really had trouble finding explicit representation of trans men that aren't minor characters and appear for more than one episode. Which is the case for Kaoru from Wonder Egg Priority and Jewel Star from She-Ra. And even when it comes to characters that could be interpreted as trans men like Naoto from Persona or Dororo, or heck, even Mulan, they always seem to have some deliberate point made in the storyline about how they're not trans and they're only cross-dressing for plot reasons. So, that's pretty frustrating. Anyway, that being said, those are just a couple of ways to present a gender non-conforming character. But before we move on, here's an honorary mention to all the characters that I feel like have big gender non-conforming energy and I just couldn't justify putting them on this list because it's more of a feeling than anything else. So here you go, here they all are. Wow, look at them all. And with that being said, these are my specific top 10-ish characters that have an integral part of their storyline being about defying gender norms. Top 10-ish gender non-conforming icons, if you will. Ranma 1 half. Ranma is actually really interesting because due to an accidental curse, he becomes a girl when splashed with cold water and back into a boy with hot water. However, being quite literally gender fluid doesn't change the fact that Ranma still identifies as a man. Physically transforming into a girl doesn't change his perception of himself, usually it just causes a bit of inconvenience and shenanigans ensue. However, that being said, Ranma has absolutely no trouble using his girl power to advance his own goals, and on multiple occasions weaponizes his femininity and even transforms into a girl on purpose. And as the series progresses, he seems to become more and more comfortable with this aspect of himself. And after a while, it's not even a secret. Basically, the whole school knows what's up, and that's totally fine. While Ranma definitely wants to go back to the way he was before, it's not hard to read his change as being parallel to being gender fluid or even the transgender experience. Sailor Moon Sailor Moon is consistently so gay, and I am here for it. And what's cool is that Haruka slash Sailor Uranus, Fisheye, and the Starlights all have slightly different gender presentations. Fisheye is a villain from Supers, and in the anime they were portrayed much more sympathetically and even got a slightly bittersweet ending where they, along with the rest of the Amazon trio, were going to be reborn as human. Canonically, at least, in the new Viz dub of Sailor Moon, Fisheye is biologically male and just enjoys cross-dressing. But because Fisheye does present as femme the majority of the time, a lot of fans commonly interpret Fisheye as a trans girl, which I can absolutely see. Some non-binary people do actually identify as being under the trans umbrella, so Fisheye could be a trans woman and or also non-binary or gender fluid and use different pronouns interchangeably. In the newest anime adaptation, the Sailor Moon Eternal movies, which follow the manga storyline more closely, Hawkeye also dressed and presented as a woman, and this time, the Amazon trio did not get even a bittersweet ending and it was really kind of a bummer. In Sailor Moon S, Haruka, or Sailor Uranus, was introduced as an antagonist before eventually teaming up with the main heroes. Haruka is really interesting, but also really difficult to class because their presentation is a little bit different in the manga and Crystal versus the 90s anime. 
In the 90s anime, they present almost exclusively as masculine in their civilian form and only present as femme during their transformation into Sailor Uranus. But in the manga and Crystal, Haruka seems to be some version of gender fluid, presenting in equal measure masculine and femme interchangeably. There's this line where Michiru states that Haruka is both male and female, and for a while people thought that meant that Haruka was possibly intersex. But Naoko Takaguchi has gone on record stating that only women can be Sailor Senshi, so when it comes to Uranus and the Starlights, at least according to Takaguchi and the manga, they're at least biologically female. And I think that's fine, but again, how you choose to interpret a fictional character is up to you. If it makes you feel closer to a character to interpret them as trans or non-binary or anything else, I don't think even the word of God should stop you from doing that. Especially considering that there is so little representation of canonical gender non-conforming human characters that the majority of the characters on this list are at best ambiguously gendered. Debuting in the last arc of Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon Stars, the Starlights also have conflicting gender presentations between the manga and anime. In the manga, they're women disguised as men for performances in the style of Takurazuka Review, which Takaguchi is a notable fan of. But the anime created an actual physical transformation between their male civilian personas and their female Sailor Starlight forms. The only problem with this is if you try to pin down one of their interchangeable identities as their true form, since it's unclear whether or not the Starlights can present as female in their civilian forms or only as Sailor Senshi. Personally, that doesn't bother me because trying to figure out what a character's quote-unquote real gender is not what I'm here for. With the Starlights, I just figure it's magic and they can do whatever they want, frankly. Next up, Oran High School Host Club. Haruhi Fujioka could literally not give a single fuck about gender and it is amazing. Haruhi is a scholarship student attending an obscenely wealthy school in the hopes of becoming a lawyer. And due to some vased based breaking shenanigans, they become entangled working at the school's high school host club to pay off their debt. Haruhi just doesn't have any strong feelings about gender and probably doesn't even feel strongly enough to bother with something like a label. Haruhi showed up to their new school in an oversized sweater and scruffy haircut, and when people assumed that they were a guy, they like didn't care enough to bother contradicting them, and Haruhi is seemingly fine with any pronouns. Jellyfish Princess The entire thesis of Jellyfish Princess is about femininity what it even means to be a woman when one doesn't exactly fit into the expectations set by traditional gender roles. The cast is made up of the Amars slash Sisterhood, a group of unemployed nerds in their late 20s slash early 30s living in the same apartment complex, and eventually they basically start their own small business together. The newest and youngest member of the Amars, Tsukimi, has an inferiority complex about her own femininity and feels like a failure for not being confident, fashionable, and stylish. Basically, she feels like a failure because she's not like other girls. Tsukimi's whole worldview about femininity is turned on its head when she meets Kuranosuke, her ideal woman who also happens to be a man. Kuranosuke really enjoys women's fashion, and what started off simply as a way to piss off his father eventually became a way to feel closer to his estranged mother, because she used to be a model. And when Kuranosuke was a child, one of the things that they bonded over was fashion. While Kuranosuke does enjoy dressing up and looking pretty, it's pretty clear that this is his preferred presentation and not gender identity. He doesn't identify as a woman, he just really likes dressing as one. Pokemon Team Rocket Jesse and James are fucking gender non-conforming legends. Team Rocket are the deeply incompetent yet lovable villains from the Pokemon anime that come up with increasingly absurd schemes in order to steal one 10-year-old boy's wrath. One of the longest running gags of the series involves tricking Ash into giving them his Pikachu by donning multiple disguises that Ash and his friends can never quite manage to see through. And those disguises are amazing. Nothing is off limits. Some of their most iconic looks are Officer Jenny, Nurse Joy, Stage Magicians, Ballet Dancers, Punks, and a married couple on their wedding day. And what is possibly one of their most iconic looks is a clear reference to the Rose of Versailles, which if you remember from my Cardcaptor Sakura video, features the bi leads Marie Antoinette and Oscar who is one of the OG gender non-conforming icons. And of course, who could forget? I am a flaming Moltres! <laughs> Where'd he get it? 
I think that costume came right out of his closet. Team Rocket absolutely oozes gender non-conforming energy. Even though they are technically villains, as unfortunately is the case for many LGBT-leaning characters depicted in media, there is a clear line drawn between them and the real bad guys. Again, when it comes to canon and series made in the 90s, gender identity isn't really touched on. So as far as canon is concerned for Jesse and James, it's just a matter of presentation. But that's not gonna stop me from headcanoning them both as bi and James is a non-binary he-they because in this house we love a girl boss and male wife. And last but not least, The Legend of Zelda, Link, and Zelda. If there is a single person out there that doesn't get gender envy from Link, then they are a stronger person than I. Link has had so many good designs over the years, but Breath of the Wild Link is just oof. I would have said that he'd reached his peak character design if the Breath of the Wild 2 trailer hadn't come into my house and personally slapped me across the face. This is what it means to go even further beyond. Link just has it all. The sword, the tunic, the little earrings, the soft androgynous frame, the long hair, tights in some games, bare legs in others. Literally the option to wear women's clothing in Breath of the Wild being a blank slate that you're meant to project yourself onto. Like, I don't know what to tell you. If you don't think Link is gender non-conforming AF, you're wrong. And of course, then there's Sheik, which, spoilers for a game from like 1998, is the alternate form of Zelda. Being from the royal family, when Hyrule fell into turmoil, she disguised herself as a man and became a fucking ninja assassin. Hell yeah! Again, I prefer to ignore the word of God when it comes to Sheik's gender identity that says that Sheik is still a girl and just Zelda's disguise and not actually a physical transformation with magic, because that personally makes it a much less fun reading for me. So yeah, anyway, this video was a little bit more chill than usual. I've been juggling a lot of projects lately, so if you like these simple lists, please let me know. Honestly, it was so hard narrowing down which characters to talk about, and I know for sure I missed a lot. Thank you to my patrons. This video was made possible because of you. And welcome to my new patrons, Chris and Bumbidi. Thank you so much. All right, I'm signing out, and I just want to let you know that everything's going to be okay. The flame that lights up the night. I am the flaming Moltres. Ha 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 ha.